Hi, I'm Gabe. I'm Jamie. I'm Randy. So last night was debate number three for the Yay. GOP candidates. It was probably the most interesting. Yeah. I mean, there was uh, almost a fist fight. <laughs> I mean, they got really into it. Oh, they? if there would have been a fist fight, <laughs> that would have made it so much better. Yeah. It was, I mean, um, <laughs> I'm laughing to myself because <laughs> when I saw uh, John Kasich first, like, coming out right off the bat, um, wanting to call them all out on, you know, cutting Medicaid and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay, John Kasich. Yeah, he's the savior of the poor. Didn't you know that? Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just like, he's, you know trying to put himself out there he promised to be a jerk that was his uh -huh. thing yeah that why did everybody do that in the first place like why did they all let everyone know prior to the debate who they were going to attack and why like why would you do that because then first of all I'm not saying that they should be attacking each other but if you're going to do it i mean at least do it in a smart way <laughs> why are you gonna let the person know so they can come up with a really good rebuttal like that makes no sense that's what they all did. And the other person just immediately was like, right. Yeah. I, I think, I think that is trying to uh, paint a picture for reporters that are watching because mm -hmm. far more people are probably going to read the stories after the debate mm -hmm. than actually sat through the debate. Yeah. And you want to make sure that your story afterwards reflects the you know, the narrative that you're trying to create. And so you do that by literally just spoon feeding I'm going to be a jerk tonight to the reporters. And then they're like, oh, look, Kasich's a jerk. He said he was going to be a jerk. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, well, jerk and the, media, and the media cycle and the, you know, hours before was John Kasich says he's going to bring it all out. Yes. So, yeah, it was funny, though, because we got I got a um, Facebook message from somebody else in a different state yesterday. And they're like, wow, do you think he's going to stay in after that meltdown? I was like, that was a meltdown. You haven't seen a John Kasich meltdown. Like, obviously, right. you don't live here in the state of Ohio when that was, like, mild compared to calling state troopers idiots for legally pulling you right. over for doing something stupid. And Yeah. I mean, J Kasich is on the same stage as Donald Trump and Chris Christie, and so he's trying to, you know, bring everyone's understanding of him up to that same level to appeal to the male, white, Republican, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. majority. Uh, who appreciates a certain level of assholishness, <laughs> assholishness. Uh, so he's, he, you know, uh -huh. he's trying to become that jerk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think he already And he still is, failed. It was he's letting everyone know. <laughs> he, he definitely failed because there's too many people on the stage. Yeah. This is their third debate. Yeah. It's still the same amount of people. people. Yeah. yeah, it's too many to really... Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. Because I, mean, I still talked about, you know, it was funny because, you know, Ben Carson and Donald Trump kind of were quieter in this debate. They mm -hmm. they weren't, I mean, it really focused more on, on the other people. And so, like, the narrative I kept hearing over and over again this morning was, well, they were quiet, so let's talk about them some more, even though they're quiet. Right. <laughs> when you would ignore any other candidate on that stage if they were quiet. And then Chris Christie, because he got that, we've got all these problems in the world. Why are we talking about fantasy football line in? Mm. <laughs> and, you know, that was at the end. And we all have short attention spans. So that's what we pay oh. attention to. And like, mm. yeah, John Kasich, you know, did this whole, I'm going to break out this time. And people are still ignoring him. It's so sad. No, the whole thing was a train wreck. And the <laughs> one. A train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> the one bit of criticism that I think I agreed with the most that from the reporters uh, that I was following on Twitter uh, was that the people that looked the worst last night was actually the moderators from CNBC yeah. because it was such a horrible, horrible debate. You know, mm -hmm. there, there was no time to actually get through any real discussion of anything because mm -hmm. it was just bickering back and forth mm -hmm. for who gets to talk the most. It's really bad. Yeah. And they didn't fact check any of it. I mean, the, the person asking the question would like ask a very researched question based on fact. And then the person answering it would be like, well, that's not true. And nobody was like, well, actually, here right. are the citations for that. It is true. You know, like it would just be like, oh, that's not the truth. And here's what I'm going to talk about now. It's like, ugh. Yeah, so annoying. They really need to start mm -hmm. self-selecting and get off the stage, you know. And I think if I was moderating the next debate and it was still that same number of people, because 
there was, I didn't even watch, there was a B team debate yeah. before. I totally did not realize that there was. There's still yeah. a B team. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like yeah. there's so many people still in this that yeah. if a couple people drop out, the main primetime debate will still be B. 10 uh -huh. or so people. Yeah, there's still four more people to drop out before we start seeing fewer people. In yeah, the that's, stage. that's the question I think they should have led off with is there are too many of you on the stage. Who's going to, you know, mm -hmm. who's going to man up and exit the stage now <laughs> yeah. and admit that them. you don't have a shot? <laughs> None of really? them because they're all narcissistic and oh. think that they can be president. Except Jeb Bush, who just kind of still feels like somebody shoved him up there. Like, a, you know, I, I, every time I see Jeb Bush, I think of, you know, a four-year-old in a ballet re recital that mom was like, get up there and do it. <laughs> and they're like, um, maybe I'll dance. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, is you know, somebody, you know, whoever it is, I'm not even sure who it is because it doesn't seem like his parents wanted him to do it. No. <laughs> somebody shoves him up there and he's like, okay, fine. He's so incredibly awkward. I love your, yes. your four-year-old in the dance recital. <laughs> That's a perfect analogy. The, the visual of Jeb Bush that was floating around the internet yesterday during the debate, not from the debate, mm -hmm. was him pulling on a hoodie uh, <laughs> because of some bet that he had with Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the mm -hmm. creator of Facebook. Mm -hmm. And he's pulling this hoodie on over his head, and then he says something to the camera, and there's a vine of all of this, mm -hmm. you know, short little video. <laughs> and I'm like, you're pulling over a zip up hoodie. <laughs> you look like a complete moron. <laughs> it has it a zips. zipper. Oh, Jed Bush. Bless your heart. And he's like squeezing into it. I'm like, unzip <laughs> the hoodie. So mm -hmm. he puts on a, uh, a hoodie like a four year old, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think, I think Ben Carson, Carly Fiorina, Mike Huckabee, they really need to get off the stage. Yes. But then you know. Carson's first in Iowa. He's looking at that stage. Well, he's not going to be when that comes down. To, I mean, he's never held an elected office. No. Mm -hmm. And I really think running for president, you have to have held some office. Carly Fiorina, the same thing. If you're not a senator, you're not a governor, you got to get off the stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Include uh, Donald Trump in that. Oh, duh. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess I skipped past the obvious one. They, yeah, he's got to get out of there. Yeah. Um, but, he, but he never will. Rand Paul needs to get off the stage. Well, he needs to get off because he's also, he can't run in Kentucky for two different positions mm -hmm. at the same time. And he's simultaneously um, running for president while running for senator. And he, they just show that he was having a fundraiser for his Senate campaign. It's like, okay, do you you okay? You think you're gonna be president? You're running for president. Mm -hmm. Then why are you still <laughs> raising money for your Senate bid? Like, what are you doing? Right. Like, pick one. Pick the Senate bid because that's the one you could maybe win. Right. And yeah. Yeah. Leave. Yeah. yeah. He is not his father. He does not have the following no. that his father has, and he just mm -mm. needs to. Well, I don't like. Was he even there? Like, I think he opened his mouth once. Like, I don't even remember. He was. He was towards the. I I saw the graphic that showed the amount of time that each candidate spoke mm -hmm. and it was fairly even mm, okay. which is different i mean that's <laughs> that's that's maybe even sadder that i don't remember a word he said when yeah he, he didn't mean equal he time. Say much, but <laughs> no. yeah yeah there, there are lots of people who just need to get off that stage and we'll see i mean if jeb bush continues in the way he did he's off that stage because he just well apparently his numbers have been really bad and he's uh i guess shifted some cash around and laid off some staff uh yeah. or just is not paying them because he's paying for ads mm -hmm. um it's, <laughs> it's never it's starting to be yeah the same story uh that you heard before rick perry exited mm -hmm. um where if you if you just yeah. watch the way they're handling their money you get a real clear mm -hmm. picture of how each campaign is going yeah um so who on earth is propping up Ben Carson? I don't know. Because, um, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're a senator or governor, you have, uh, you know, probably more than a decade mm -hmm. of campaign finance, you know, a history and mm -hmm. a whole crew that does fundraising for you and has done so for years. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. walking in cold as somebody who's never held office before, unless you're, you know, billionaire mm -hmm. donald trump um mm -hmm. he's completely self-financing his campaign yeah. as he said last well, according to his <laughs> finance chair which i don't remember his name i just remember that when um he was being interviewed and lindsey graham sat down lindsey graham went to shake his hand and he didn't shake his hand but anyway um <laughs> nice <laughs> he says That's that it. ben carson is also a businessman and apparently he's like 
he was on the board of like Kellogg's mm -hmm. and on the board of like some other companies. So he was doing business while he was a doctor in the medical field too. Mm -hmm. But again, not that makes him qualified to be president. No. Right. Like I think he's flat understand tax. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh there wasn't any real big updates in terms of reproductive rights in the debate yesterday. Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. got mentioned once by Ted Cruz. It wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, nobody really jumped on anything related to women's rights, uh, reproductive rights, of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, in the past two weeks, however, here in Ohio, we've had big updates. Yes, we have. Um, so we had a really awesome uh, rally last Tuesday. Um, there was like a couple of hundred people that came out and, um, the next day is when we had testimony of to, um, defund Planned Parenthood in the state Senate. A lot of people came out that day. It was mm -hmm. probably like maybe 20 or 30 people that came out. Um, yeah, there was in 30 the hearing room. Well, there were yeah, 30 the people. Room. Yeah. There were 30 people who actually testified and then probably another yeah. 15 or 20 at least just coming to be there. So yeah, there's exactly. a good crowd. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Really, really good testimony. Yeah, except um, that it was cut except drastically short. Yes. Well, originally 90 seconds, uh -huh. and then it got bumped up to two minutes. Two whole minutes. Um, yeah, two whole minutes. So that is the amount of testimony that people got to give. Um, but to be fair, like, he really did let everybody go yeah, over. Did. I mean, it wasn't really like two minutes, you need to sit down. Um, but that's what they told everyone, a two minute time limit. Well, the um, two minute time limit would have been okay had it been two minutes plus the members of the committee get to ask questions. Yeah, there was no questions until, until after everything. Yeah. Yeah. No questions. Yeah, no questions until after everyone had already testified. And then I think, did the Republicans even ask any questions? Yeah, they asked me that one. Remember, I was the only one who got a question from the like, Republicans because I poked the bear. Because uh, I was the only one who mentioned the stupid debunked videos. Oh, okay. I got called up there to answer questions about um, fetal tissue donation in mm -hmm. Ohio, which doesn't That's exist right. because it's illegal. Yeah, he right. didn't like that answer very much. <laughs> they had they had over a dozen people who worked for or currently work for yeah. Planned Parenthood. They had physicians. Mm -hmm. Uh, of all of the people in the room, they call up. Uh, no, but because I mean, they know that she knows. You know, we're we're pretty much just advocates here <laughs> on a political level. We're yeah. not, you know, uh, we're not doing anything. Healthcare medical professionals, at all. yeah, yeah. And so for you to get that question, I was like, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, yeah. I called them terrorists, so I think he felt the need to, you know, challenge me in some way. Back you called again. people who target clinics terrorists. Yes. And then, you didn't call the members of the no. committee terrorists. I called I told I said that they oh. were cohorting with terrorists to ah, yes. pass this bill. Okay. So yes. And that so, was a question that was asked by Edna Brown the mm -hmm. previous week yeah. when the bill was um uh Put getting its it. first hearing. Mm -hmm. Uh Edna Brown asked Ohio Right to Life, you know, do you know that the people who made this video are associated with people who have bombed clinics? Mm -hmm. And Ohio Right to Life said yes. And yeah. then uh, she asked, yeah, she followed up with, are you okay with that? And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, sure. But we don't, we don't, we yeah, don't that, support violence, though. You know, they, they quickly followed with that, which is complete BS because you're colluding with them. You partner with them all the freaking time. You can't right. tell me that you're against violence when you partner with people who bomb abortion clinics. And somebody who actually was denied an entry visa into... Australian just like three weeks ago because the Australian government yeah. was scared that he would push violence against abortion providers in, in their country. Yeah, I like saw that. They pulled his entrance visa because of that. And that's who they're working with that's on this bill. It's completely ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, actually, it was a really good hearing. I mean, the people who went were amazing. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, member of the general public, Brooke, came and shared her story about getting an IUD inserted. And I think that was like my most fabulous moment ever because she was giving a very graphic, like in a blow by blow of her IUD insertion. Mm -hmm. And the white Republican males on that committee have never looked that uncomfortable before in their lives. Like they're just kind of squirming yes. and sitting there like, oh, am I hearing this? Don't talk to us about your lady parts. It's like we just want to regulate, regulate them. them. Yeah. We don't want to actually hear about it or know about it. I mean, seriously. <laughs> 
That's you, gross. You women. <laughs> Oversharing. Do you, yes. Do you have no modesty? <laughs> so, yeah. No, if they had pearls, I mean, yeah. Yeah, they would have been ridiculous. clutching them. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I knew where you were going with that one. <laughs> Clutching their pearls. Yes. Uh, so despite our awesome witnesses, the bill did pass out of committee. Of course. Went straight to the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, some good debate on the floor. Yeah. Some really great, great debate. Like all but one of the Democrats actually spoke up. Even a Democrat out of Cincinnati, um, Cecil Thomas, a brand new senator, who was actually endorsed by Ohio Right to Life in his campaign, actually spoke out against the bill and voted against the bill. So that was that was a pretty good Yep. Good we heard good testimony from, from like you said, nearly every uh, Democrat. Um, I thought the question that uh, I enjoyed uh, watching get asked the most uh, came from Minority Leader Joe Schiavone, who oh, asked I the Senate it. president. Oh. The I Senate love president, that. Yeah, yes. the Senate president is the sponsor of the bill um, and said, you know, what's the rush? That I think literally was the question yes what's the rush why now yes what is your hurry to pass this legislation mm -hmm. because they haven't received information back yet um from odh as to how this bill is going to affect the women of ohio mm -hmm. right so and so again like what is the rush to pass it before you even i mean you're gonna do it well because you're gonna do it anyway that's mm -hmm. the rush but of course he said the question was out of order and yeah. didn't answer. Mm -hmm. Refused to answer the question. Yeah. So he gets the walk of shame. Keith Faber uh -huh. can't even answer sure. what's the rush. Yeah. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, refused to justify why uh, we have to accelerate the defunding of HIV AIDS testing, breast mm -hmm. and cervical cancer screenings, uh, infertility treatment programs. Sex education for foster kids. Right. I, I mean, really. Rape prevention education. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Infant, Domestic, uh, I mean, uh, relationship abuse, um, mm -hmm. education for high school students. Right. Um, yeah. I, th I mean, like, infant really? mortality reduction programs. Mm -hmm. All yeah. of these are getting cut because they hate Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you know what? Like follow up, like really close second maybe on the walk of shame was even Shannon Jones, Senator Shannon Jones. Oh my God. Because yeah. her, her explanation for why we should defund Planned Parenthood's infant mortality program was our infant mortality rate is so bad so these programs aren't working so we need to put the money where it's working I'm like okay if that's your argument then every single infant mortality program in the entire state of ohio should be defunded not just this one like right. if your argument is that this one very small program that operates in one community in the entire state is the reason why the entire state of ohio's infant mortality rate is awful i don't even know how your brain functions yeah. like, <laughs> I cannot comprehend. No. <laughs> yeah, Shannon Jones, uh, she's a senator from Cincinnati, has talked, I think, you know, with very honest interest mm -hmm. about reducing infant mortality. And even accepts that birth spacing and family planning is an important part of that now, which was a huge movement on her part. Right. She refused to accept that at the beginning. Right. But then votes to defund family planning and birth spacing and everything else on the planet. So obviously yeah. it hasn't all sunk yeah. in. Her, yes. her rhetoric is well-intentioned. Her voting record is still abysmal. Yeah. Uh, if you watched her testimony and then you also watched Bill Seitz, who's another senator from the Cincinnati area, mm -hmm. um, he brought up a, kind of an interesting point about all of this debate is all over. Uh, his figure was $1.3 million. Mm -hmm. Um and he totally mixed apples and oranges because then he talked about he talked about some of Planned Parenthood's finances within the state of Ohio, mm -hmm. which aren't really relevant because they don't go towards these programs. And he also talked about how much money Planned Parenthood gets from the federal government, which is of course for all of, all of the affiliates everywhere. Mm -hmm. Not every state is equal. So, you know, yeah. when you when you push aside this yada yada, you know, crap. Okay, Ohio spends you know, through these programs, 1.3 million. I'll, I'll take his, his stat at face value. Mm -hmm. He's saying this isn't a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 you know, Ohio, Ohio's got yeah. like a $54 billion budget. Yeah. So 1.3 million. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. compared to 54 billion, it's, it's not a huge amount of money. I think that's funny that that's like his whole, <laughs> we don't spend that much money on this stuff anyway. So what, what does it matter that. if we spend less? Right. And so then you've got Shannon Jones over there saying that 
these programs aren't working. We need to spend these dollars elsewhere. And I'm like, well, either it's not a lot of money and it's not <laughs> worth screwing around with. Yes. Or this is critical and it needs to go somewhere else. Their two arguments kind of went back to back. They were about the same time on exactly. the floor and they were completely contradictory. Yes. yes. And everybody's sitting on the floor because, you know, they're all, you know, they're mostly Republicans and they love hearing all of this, uh, you know, all of these arguments are like, oh, yeah. 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 I'm like, no, wait a minute. These two things they can't don't exist go together. together. No, they don't at all. No. I'm like, either we're not spending that much money on these programs or we're spending a huge amount and it needs to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It can't be both. No. Yeah. Mathematically. Yeah. Well, another argument that goes along with that one is the whole argument that, um, there are 600 other places which include like crisis pregnancy centers, administrative offices and health centers inside of elementary school where I'm pretty sure you couldn't walk in and get an IUD. Right. Um, they want to so, give this money to places like dentists yeah. and mm -hmm. federally mm -hmm. qualified health centers that don't actually provide all, you healthcare. know, yeah. yeah. So, but, but even if you take their number, cause that's the number they push, they want to take money from one provider and spread it to 600 providers without right. putting one more cent into the program. Right. How in the hell is that supposed to effectively get health care to women in Ohio? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're splitting one pot of money, $1.3 million if you take their number, which is weird anyway, and split it 600 ways instead of one way. How in the hell is that supposed to work? But, right. You know, no. details, facts. We don't. Do what Shannon Jones did, though. When you need something, just go to your primary provider. Yeah. You need to call them up, make an appointment, and, and they'll see you. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have one, I don't know what the hell you're supposed to do. Yeah. But that, that was her suggestion. <laughs> when I needed something, I just called up my primary provider. Like that Nice is to have point. her privilege in it. Yeah. <laughs> right. That she cannot even <laughs> recognize. But I guess that's the whole point. But, I mean, really. Really, yeah. lady? Okay. Mm-hmm. No. They do love to talk about how this bill won't reduce the amount of money available, but yeah. it will spread it so thin that all of Wordless. these, you know, yeah. qualified providers, here's your sack of nickels. Yeah. <laughs> now take on these uh -huh. thousands of women. Right. Yeah. Which also, um, to go back to the testimonies, uh, one thing that really stuck out to me was when they called um, the doctor, the anti-doctor yeah. back up. Um, to talk about how who who's going to take all of these women, who's going to take Medicare, mm -hmm. like, um, and so he asked. I believe what is his name? You know, oh, it was um, um Senator Skindle. Skindle. Okay, I like him. Mm -hmm. he, so Senator, he, yeah, they so, were all fabulous, but yes, yeah, he he kind of rocked was, it that day. Yes. He really did. Um, and asked her like, so what is the wait time? First of all, you can call Planned Parenthood and they'll get you in within 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. He out called her up and said, what is the, are you taking new patients? Mm -hmm. Like, first of all, I don't even think she said she was, but if she were, it would be at least six weeks. Yeah. yeah. And then he asked, do you take Medicare? No. no. So no what, mm -hmm. why are you here saying that we can do this, that they, that women will be able to go else, um, somewhere else. It, no, they're not. <laughs> not low-income women. No. Not women who uh, work a retail job or low-income job where you cannot ask for days off in advance be like, oh, hey, just to let you know, I have a doctor's appointment like next week at this time. Mm -hmm. Can I can I leave and go out? Like, no, that's not how it works. No. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about any of that. No. And, but you're kind of coming in here and you're going to make it impossible for these women to be able to get health care. And you, you don't even have to think about that. Like, you, like no. how is that possibly caring about, caring about women? It's not. And they no. put it under the guise of something totally different. Mm -hmm. It's really, it really pisses me off that that's not apparent. Yeah. And that, that very point was addressed on the floor. Uh, Senator Cafaro, Capri Cafaro, mm -hmm. um, talked about her own experience trying to get yeah. an IUD, mm -hmm. dealing with the threat of tumors, and how, you know, she really felt that every day counted. You know, her, her doctor was yeah. telling her that um, she wasn't able to get, I think that was her story, was she wasn't able to get an IUD uh, mm -hmm. inserted promptly by one doctor and was yeah. immediately able to turn to another. And so prompt care, uh, you know, was critical for her to avoid getting, mm -hmm. you know, tumors yeah. on her cervix. Yeah. So mm -hmm. six weeks, you know, can make mm -hmm. a huge difference. Exactly. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about early detection of cancer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you can get in at all.
Mm -hmm. Exactly. So patient stories have been critical. Um, the defunding battle uh, moves on to the House. I'm sure they're going to have hearings very soon because mm -hmm. John Kasich really wants to sign this yep. thing. And, sure that's, and that's the answer to Faber's question of, of Mr. Yeah. Mooney's question to Faber is what's the rush? John Kasich wants to sign this bill and he's running for president and yeah. he's my buddy. So I'm going to help him out. Yeah. <laughs> that's the answer to the question. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of wish it would have been phrased that way, but uh, what's the rush was, was pretty good. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's going on. Meanwhile, all the other bans mm -hmm. uh, are still out there, including the 20 week ban. Uh, yeah. And just this week we heard from uh, one patient. How'd that go? Yeah, it went really well. Um, so Shava is a young woman, a married woman from the Cincinnati area. Um, she and her husband found out earlier this year, I guess, that she was pregnant and they were very, very excited. And like all families went into the, they're 20 ish, 22 weeks. She, uh -huh. she went in at 22 weeks, you know, anatomical ultrasound to see, you know, if it was a boy or a girl and what the sex of the baby was and, you know, just to see and get more pictures and, you know, walked into the room like everybody all excited, um, found out that they were having a girl and that was what she wanted. They were doing the, she wanted a girl, he wanted a boy thing. And right. so, you know, she got very excited. And then like you hear in so many of these stories, the room got kind of quiet and the tech got kind of serious and she's like I'm having trouble you know he's a little small and she's a little small so you know i'm trying to can't really see some of the organs like i'm gonna have to go get the doctor right the doctor came back in and confirmed yes it was small and because you know your general OBGYN has decent old machine but not like the high level diagnostic one um you know he's like well you know you're small baby's small it could just be you know we don't know no, it could be something very, you know, it could be dwarfism, it could be normal, but just small. We don't know. You've got to see a specialist. So luckily they got her into a specialist that day. Um, and kind of tragically in her story too, the ultrasound tech at the specialist got all happy and excited and printed more pictures and seemed like everything was okay. So they kind of got their hope up that, oh, okay, everything is okay. It's just small. It'll be fine. The doctor comes in and does another ultrasound and tells um, them that the baby's head is normal size, but the body is measuring at 18 weeks instead of 22 weeks. Wow. And there's a, a, a fatal spinal deformity. There is a zero chance that the baby will survive. Wow. And so they were faced with very difficult decision. Um, and what adds to the pain of the story was that the hospital was completely not helpful. You know, she asked mm -hmm. questions about, so can I terminate? And they're like, yeah, I guess, you know, I don't know what Ohio laws are, you know, blah, blah. And it just kind of left her hanging. So of course, like all of us, mm -hmm. you think I need women's health care. Where do you call? Oh, Planned Parenthood. Um, called Planned Parenthood, but the Planned Parenthood in Cincinnati doesn't provide services that late. So they referred her to Haskell's Clinic in Dayton, which is suing to stay open. Right. Um, but because she was, you know, kind of halfway through her 22nd week and they only go through the end of the 22nd week, they couldn't get her in fast enough because so many of our clinics have closed. Right. And he's got too many patients backed up. So um, he referred her to a clinic in um, Georgia or a clinic in Chicago. And Chicago was closer. So this was a Tuesday on Thursday. They were in Chicago at this clinic. Friday, the procedure happened and Sunday they came back home again. And it was just, her story is painful on so many levels. And it's just such a perfect example of the restrictions that already exist in Ohio impacting access to care. The fact that the genetic counselor that she was forced to see before she could get an amniocentesis couldn't talk to her about abortion because we have that ban on genetic services funding going towards counseling on abortion. The fact that, you know, she couldn't, the hospital couldn't provide it because the only hospital in Cincinnati that used to provide it was the University of Cincinnati and we've got a public hospital ban. So she couldn't right. go to the hospital in her community because we banned that hospital from providing We've got that doctors care. that can do this, but yes. they're not allowed. <clears throat> exactly. The, you know, although Ohio law technically in Ohio, Ohio right to life loves to point this out that no, -uh, it's legal to 24 weeks. No, -uh, she should have been able to get it in Ohio. It's not our fault. It is their fault because yeah, it says 24 weeks, but it requires um, viability testing that I put in air quotes for people just listening because viability testing doesn't exist. Right. So, you know, our clinics can't get close to 24 weeks because what if some other doctor says, well, I would have considered that a viable fetus and that doctor then goes to jail for performing an abortion in Ohio. Right. So and that 24 week limit is the law in Ohio, but there's no medical foundation. I mean, no. her pregnancy was mm -hmm. failing no matter yes. what they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, at 22 well, weeks or, you know, at 30, 
32 weeks. And because the fetus didn't have kidneys and the fetal kidneys are what produces amniotic fluid, mm -hmm. she had no amniotic fluid. And if you, you do research on like what happens when you don't have like the amniotic fluid protects the body of the right. fetus. So, you know, it's getting basically crushed by the walls of the uterus when there's nothing floating around it. So, you know, it was a catastrophe on multiple levels and, you know, Yes, we see, but you know, we're hearing online, well, she should have just, you know, stillbirth and blah, blah, blah. You know, that would have been a better choice. And not what? for her, not for no. her. You know, the, a reporter actually asked her in the, in the press conference we did, you know, did you consider that? And she said, that would have been my biggest nightmare. It would have been right. what I would, would have been forced to do if I didn't have access to going to Chicago. Right. But that would have been my biggest nightmare, that carrying around a pregnancy that you knew was doomed. Yeah, it would have been, you know, a nightmare for her. So luckily she did have the resources to pick up and take five days off work. And her husband took days off work. I think her in-laws actually came with them too. her family was able to help pay for the travel and the cost, which they she put this at three thousand yeah, dollars. She put it about three thousand dollars that she needed mm -hmm. to come up with instantaneously, which, you know, for for everybody I know is <laughs> an enormous amount of money. Yeah. Yes. So, so and her insurance company is now fighting paying for it. Um, which they probably wouldn't have done if it was done in a hospital, but because she did it in a different state and everything else, they're fighting whether or not it was medically necessary. So she's fighting with her insurance company and everything else. So right. it's just, um, she was amazing in that press conference, um, sharing her story. Um, I know it's still very, very painful for her, but she keeps repeating over and over again. She wants to tell her story so that she can help other people so that they don't have to go through right. what she went through. Um, so she will come back and she'll testify hopefully against the 20 week ban. Um, but the response from the other side was just uh, uh, mind blowing because Mike Gunnarakis from a higher right to life was, well, we can't carve out exceptions for every single woman. So we just have to protect life. Like <laughs> such an ignorant response. It is. Your oh, face is a heartless response. Yes. You have Such no a idea response for real, like people who are actually living, breathing, standing in front of you and you have no compassion mm -hmm. for them whatsoever. No, there's zero compassion. Right. We think, I think one of these other quotes were abortion is never the right answer unless a woman is about to die. <laughs> like, yeah. No, actually not the case. So, I mean, that sort of empty rhetoric has no actual, uh, understanding for the real world, mm -hmm. you know, facts that were in front of this woman. Yeah. You know, she had something inside of her that was dying. Yeah. And she wanted it to live. She really did. Mm -hmm. I mean, the tears in her eyes when she was talking about, you know, having a daughter mm -hmm. and then to lose that and to lose it in a way where you had to suddenly come up with, you know, the funds to have this taken mm -hmm. care of, you know, in a way that was prompt that protected her health. Uh, that had some amount of dignity uh, when she was talking about having to basically post on Facebook, "Hey, okay, everybody, I'm not pregnant anymore. And this is why yeah. it's just thoroughly heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, listening to her story, it did emphasize a lot of, uh, I think we saw a lot of symptoms that are a product of the various bills that John Kasich has passed mm -hmm. over the years, you know, healthcare professionals not being able to provide answers because of yeah. gag rules mm -hmm. is a problem. Mm -hmm. People not being able to use private insurance to pay for abortion procedures is another law that he's passed. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem. You know, later term abortion bans. She faced and forced her to go to other states at mm -hmm. an enormous cost that other people couldn't have come up with. That's a huge problem. Yeah. All of these are case signed mm -hmm. restrictions. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now we're just going to make them worse. So, yeah. so um, she, Shava definitely gets that. That's what she said this week um, for sharing her amazing right. brave story um, with the world, especially so soon after it yeah. all happened. Um, yeah. This was just like, like six a, weeks ago. Yeah. This is very September. recent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she'll be joined with at least two other women, hopefully and testifying on why this 20 week abortion ban is bad. Because again, the sponsor of this bill keeps talking about how, well, you know, these are so, so, so rare that we shouldn't address them in the bill. And then goes on to say that these are decisions that should be left to doctors and ethics committees at hospitals. Her bill doesn't allow for that. It says it is illegal at 20 weeks. 
Right. It doesn't say it's illegal at 20 weeks unless the ethics committee at the hospital decides it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it says illegal. So all of that is completely mute. The fact that she keeps saying that, I just... Mm. Yeah, there's no room, you know, wiggle room no, in this no wiggle bill. Room. It's no. very callous against any of these situations. Even if it's a, a procedure based on protecting the woman's health, she has to be on the verge of dying. It can't just be a health problem that can be reversed or those kinds of things. So right. you're looking at, you know, a doctor could say at 18 weeks that your health's getting kind of bad. I would recommend you, actually, no, at 20 weeks saying I would recommend you, you know, getting a termination. But I can't do that now because we're at 20 weeks. And you've got to be almost dying before I can. So right. we we'll, have to wait till sepsis sets in and you're actually almost dying before we can help you. Right. And we know how well that worked in Ireland a couple of years ago. So Right. And these situations are, um, you know, they're not as common as, they're definitely not frequent enough to justify mm -hmm. some sort of legislative, uh, you know, solution, if you want to call it a solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the reporters in the room during the press conference came over to me afterwards, uh, was asking, you know, exactly how frequent these occur. I had the laptop there. I pulled up the Ohio induced abortion report. 133 um, uh, pregnancies were terminated at 21 weeks or later mm -hmm. uh, out of 20,000 some mm -hmm. abortions in the state. So 133 is it. There, you know, most of these are traumatic situations mm -hmm. where it was a wanted pregnancy. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for this legislation. Yeah. It's a or, horrible attack. on. Women. Yeah. And, and a lot of them are that or the fact that what we're seeing in those statistics is that more and more of those women are women who are forced by all the other laws John Kasich put in place to seek abortion care later on. Right. Because it's become more expensive because we require two in-person visits. And we, it, you know, it, we've closed half the clinic, so there are waiting periods now. So, frankly, you know, they're so concerned about these later-term abortions, but they're passing all these bills on the other end, forcing women further into pregnancy to get abortion care. So right. you can either care, again, kind of like we talked about earlier, you can either care about women getting abortions later, or you can restrict access to it. But you can't do both because one causes the other, and yeah. you are now the cause of that. Right. So it's just ridiculous let's talk about something fun okay yes. <laughs> so i'm just like sitting over here so depressed <laughs> it uh, is depressed, but people mistake that um if a republican gets in the white house mm -hmm. like then that is it all of them are against abortion all of them are against half of them are against it with no exceptions whatsoever um, except the life of the mother. And even in that case, Marco Rubio said, I don't see, I haven't seen any evidence where an abortion is ever medically necessary. I didn't realize he had a medical background, but apparently so. I should introduce um, him to one of my friends who's only here because she. Yeah. Really? <coughs> so, yes, yeah, so let's talk about something else because they're ridiculous. Uh, before we move on, though, uh, Sheva's story did get uh, some very positive media coverage. It, uh, it was on TV here, uh, the local NBC affiliate. Um, the Columbus Dispatch wrote about it, but also the Cincinnati Inquirer. Uh, the Inquirer is owned by the same parent company as the USA Today, so the story is now on the USA Today website. You can find it on our Facebook page, so mm -hmm. go to Facebook and search for NARAL Pro-Choice Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the positive uh, part of today's podcast uh, is the abortion access without apology package of legislation. Uh, we promised that we'd talk about it yes. uh, after we did a review of all the bad bills. Uh, so there's supposed to be six bills. Mm -hmm. Five have been introduced. Yep. One more, they're still ironing out the wrinkles. Yep, should be introduced later this week. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about the uh, the five that we've got language for. Uh, the first one, House Bill 356, uh, is public funding for abortion care. So this reverses the ban uh, on public funding for abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and does this address uh, public hospitals being able to perform the procedure? No, that's actually included in one of the yeah. other bills. It's either in this one or done. the insurance one. I can't remember which one because we broke the funding into two. But yes, it definitely um, deals with the Medicaid because, you know, and I've been sitting in all these Planned Parenthood defunding hearings, like screaming at the top of my head, like, I really, really wish taxpayer right. dollars went to pay for low-income people having abortions. Mm -hmm. That is not the case right now. Right. So if you want to scream about that, that then you know pass this bill and then you can talk about taxpayer funding for abortion right. um 
Because <laughs> federal law bans it. Yes. yes. But federal law bans it for federal funds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because states could do yeah, this. Because Medicaid is a federal state partnership in a way that I still don't totally understand. It's so complicated. Um, states can come back in and, and pay for it with state Medicaid dollars. So, like California and New York and those kinds of places do provide. Right. Medicaid coverage for abortion care. So that bill will allow for Medicaid coverage um, of abortion care. And taxpayer funding for abortions is, a. I mean, this is kind of something where, uh, unfortunately, we lose the rhetoric battle where people are like, well, no taxpayer abortion, uh, mm -hmm. taxpayer funds go to abortions. They really, really should. And I think yeah. if people understood the nuts and bolts of how it works and you know, if, if you take money out of the equation, then women will get earlier, less invasive procedures. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody talks about how they hate these late term abortions. Well, let's make sure early term abortions mm -hmm. are really, really easy yeah. to pay for mm -hmm. so much so that, you know, if you're broke, you can get taxpayer assistance. Mm -hmm. This is a terrific bill. We should absolutely be yes. uh, passing this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next bill <laughs> uh, is to remove the waiting period for abortions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you really look at what's impacting access to care, it's fewer clinics being closed mm -hmm. by other things we'll talk about in a minute. And the fact that now women have to go to them twice, physically go yeah. to them twice um, with a, with the 24 at least hour twice. wait, at least, yeah, twice. at least twice. And in some cases three, four times because mm -hmm. there's laws now about who, what doctor is, is the doctor. So if you see one doc, you see Dr. A at your first appointment, you can't really see Dr. B to do the procedure. You've got to see Dr. A. So if Dr. A is not there, you have to reschedule. It's becomes this whole big deal. So, um, so women in Ohio are forced by law to think about their decision for another 24 hours. Because They've already made up their mind. Exactly. Yes. If you've walked into an abortion clinic, you know what the decision is. Right. And frankly, our abortion clinics do a really good job of screening women. And if they don't feel like you're solid in your decision, they don't let you do it until you're solid in your decision. Because they don't want women to make a decision that isn't the right one for them. Right. So, or if she, if, you know, the woman walking in is undecided mm -hmm. and, you know, she's just there to get information. Yeah. It's not like she's committed as soon as she walks in the door. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we're not nobody's, you down. Yeah, nobody's tying you to a table. Or, yeah. Right. They'll, they'll provide answers mm -hmm. and then you can come back later. It's. Yeah. Again, the yeah, rhetoric. I hate using it. The rhetoric. Oh, they're forcing women to <laughs> yes. get abortions. Like right. nobody you know, right. forcing them to. I hate get, using a metaphor, but it's kind of, you know, it's like buying a car just because you walk into the dealership, yeah. you're not committed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody's going to criticize me for comparing abortions to <laughs> buying cars, but <laughs> you can change your mind. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, point, yeah. Well, it's about the same amount of regulation. So I actually it might be less to buy a car. I don't know. No, I'm sure there's less. <laughs> You don't have to wait 24 hours before you actually pick your that car up from the true. dealership. You can take it home immediately. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. So eliminating the 24 hour waiting period will really get rid of a huge obstacle um, standing in the way, especially for women, rural women who don't live close to the clinic or um, women, especially in like domestic violence situations where getting away from their abuser once is hard enough to do it twice right. without being detected is almost impossible. So, this really, again, all of these bills really address what we keep talking about and the fact that as more and more of these restrictions are put in place, middle class and rich women will still be able to get abortion care because they'll be able to drive and they'll be able to go right. and they'll be ha able to take the time off work and pay the extra money and all those kinds of things. But low income women get squeezed harder and harder and harder and harder. So all of these bills kind of address you know, that gap of you know, public funding will even that playing field. Getting rid of the 24-hour waiting period will even that playing field. So you're not taking two days right. off of your minimum wage job to right. get an abortion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Ohio law basically now is set up where <laughs> if you don't live close to that abortion provider, you almost need a hotel room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And adding in that expense, uh, you know, to yeah. the already existing cost of the procedure is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, so House Bill 357 removes abortion waiting periods. Uh, House Bill 360 uh, permits insurance coverage for abortions, something that John Kasich specifically uh, banned through previous legislation. Mm -hmm. Two different bills, in fact. Right. So when Kasich came into office, we already forbid state employees 
from using their state employee, their state employee coverage couldn't cover abortion. It's really interesting when I became, when I did some grad work at Ohio State and I took the stipend that they give to graduate students to help pay for student health insurance. Okay. I got this letter from um, the university that says if I use my stipend, I'm um, automatically foregoing the abortion coverage that exists in the OSU student health plan because I couldn't use state dollars oh, to pay for an insurance plan that covered abortion care. They were handing you cash. Yeah. essentially, and uh -huh. saying, here, don't spend this on an abortion. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> so that already existed. So Kasich came in and he expanded that to local government employees from the party that thinks local control is the best thing ever. Right. We're telling local governments that their local insurance cut plans can't cover abortion care. And then he expanded it again by signing a law that said, if you get your insurance through the healthcare exchanges, even if you're paying for it 100% with your own money. So From no, a private insurance yeah, company. Private insurance company, your own private money, that exchange cannot include plans that cover abortion care in Ohio. So if you're getting your money through the new Obamacare exchanges, right. you cannot get your insurance and cover abortions in that insurance plan through right. the exchange. These are not taxpayer dollars in any way. It's your money mm -hmm. and your chosen private insurance company. Yes. Cannot pay for an abortion. Mm -hmm. really. So the, that bill will remove all, all of those restrictions from all of those government. plans. Uh -huh. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Local control of schools, local control of everything, except your insurance plans. We're going to tell you how to do that. Yes. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, House Bill 360 will end transfer agreements. Yeah, so as I said earlier, there's two things that really impact access to care, the 24-hour wait and two visits and the fact that half of our abortion clinics have closed and the vast majority of those mm -hmm. clinics have closed because of issues with transfer agreements. So this would get rid of those medically unnecessary transfer agreements because as we've talked about many times before on this show, transfer agreements are completely medically unnecessary because when there's an emergency at a clinic, they call 911, the 911 place sends the ambulance to the clinic, the EMT transports patient to whatever hospital the ambulance driver wants to drive to. Mm -hmm. There's no bearing on the fact that we have a transfer agreement with this hospital across town. This hospital is closer and the ambulance is going to drive them there. So in, in some cases, the transfer agreement is completely ignored anyway. It's a meaningless right. piece of paper that's required by the state um, for clinics to have. And because of public pressure on hospitals and our ban on public hospitals, um, having transfer agreements. Mm -hmm. Clinics can't find these transfer agreements and that's where we end up in the position we are in Cincinnati and Dayton where um, the Department of Health keeps denying variances from that uh, from that transfer agreement requirement. So yeah. this will really help um, the, our clinics stay open and will not impact how safe these, these clinics are right. in any way, shape, or form. Transfer agreements do not increase the quality of care no. No. at all. No. no. Completely unnecessary mm -hmm. and very harmful. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. In fact, they probably decrease safety right. because right. We're, we're losing clinics and women are when women can't access an abortion clinic, they're not going to say, oh, wait, I guess I won't just have an abortion. They're going to try something else. So Right. Uh, House Bill 376, the last one we have a bill number four, removes CPC funding. Yay. Well, it doesn't actually remove their funding. It just tells them if they get the funding, they have to stop lying to people. And that's kind of the cornerstone of what they do. So, right. yeah. yeah, they won't be able to get the money anymore. Um, so, yeah, they so, do lie to people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the, I keep using this quote because it's just so outrageous. One of the crisis pregnancy centers that we researched that our people went to and talked to people at actually told our person that because ab abortion is a blind procedure, the doctor has no idea what he's doing. So he'll suck out your baby, your uterus, your appendix, and your intestines too. Right. What is, what is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what does she mean by a blind, like he's blindfolded or something? This is like, like if what? a fifth grader described healthcare. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Like, who would even believe that? Like, okay. Okay. I can't. Yeah. I really can't. So you know that's okay. the kind of stuff that's happening in these places, and they're now getting our taxpayer dollars. We want to have a discussion dollars. about where taxpayer dollars should go. It should go to actual healthcare providers yes. like abortion right. clinics, and not go to places that lie to women about healthcare. Um, but unfortunately, in Ohio, it's backwards. So yeah, this bill will um, stop crisis pregnancy centers from lying and coercing women. Thank if God. they get state money. Yes. I like the quote about the uh, the one in California where she told her that her IUD was her baby. Yeah. 
<laughs> I like to tell that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah, it's like this, I've never seen it. It's anything. T-shaped and made of copper. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I know. Did you have a weird experience with a floating thing in the air? <laughs> a light post. People were making memes about, you know, the the uh, baby daddy light post. <laughs> this is a little IUD. You're going to grow up to be big and tall and strong. And that's, and that's the place where they want to defund Planned Parenthood and give money to those kinds of places. Yes. It sounds like a fabulous right. idea. Right. So, yeah, so that's the last one we have a bill number four. Yeah. And then there's one more. There's one more uh, to end clinic harassment. Right? Yeah. Uh, which is a huge problem in the yeah. state of Ohio right mm-hmm. now. Yes. Yeah. So one of the reasons the clinic in Dayton is having trouble finding doctors for their variants is because Clear Data Equal has targeted their doctors in their variants with mm-hmm. a campaign they call the Killers Among Us. Yeah. So they put the pictures of the doctors with their you know, traditional bloody fetus signs on a big, huge cargo truck and drive it around the neighborhoods that these doctors live in. They've sent postcards with the doctor's picture with the killer yeah. among us. One of the ladies who was at the happy hour that I had in Dayton on Tuesday night, I had received one in the mail. Oh, really? She told everyone. She was <laughs> like, it's really crazy. And I'm mm-hmm. like, and um, then the other people just like, how is that even possible? That's really, um, I mean, you're very like close to the line of death threats because mm-hmm. you're giving out their personal address and saying there's yeah. killers among you. you what do you take care of that? Yes. What do you expect extreme people mm-hmm. to do with that information? Yeah. So um, the doctors there have been highly harassed constantly yeah. and there really isn't a really good way to combat that without physical contact. Mm-hmm. So um, the bill will, allow for a civil right of action. So restraining orders and suing the harassers, um, uh, the doctor can sue the harassers and get a restraining order against the harassers. They can't get restraining orders already? It has to reach a certain level before that can even like be considered. And we haven't reached that level with this campaign yet. So you can imagine what that level is. It really, uh, it really does yeah. have to get to a specific threat of physical violence before anything can really start to happen in a lot of these cases. Cause it's, That's cause so we have, like... cause we have the amazing American right of free speech, but this has crossed the line yes. uh, when you're, when you're encouraging violence against people you've crossed a line. Unfortunately, by law, it really hasn't crossed a line. So this will give a civil right of action. It's not a criminal act. It'll be completely civil Mm -hmm. um, for employees of healthcare facilities who are being harassed. And then it will also create a buffer zone, but not in the traditional traditional example that's been struck down by the Supreme Court. It's not like a 20-foot line around the door. It's actually kind of a floating buffer zone around the individual patient so that you can't, no, and nobody can really get up to the patient without permission. So you'd have to give permission to enter your personal space, basically. Hmm. So it allows for some protections for our patients entering the clinics because beyond the harassment on the physicians, we're really seeing an uptick in the number of protesters outside of our clinics, blocking driveways um, and harassing the patients walking into the clinics. So that'll add a little layer of protection for the patients as well. So that's the last bill. Should drop by the end of the week. Hopefully I have a bill number by next time. Okay. Um, So from now on, you know, when people talk about the problems uh, that women face, we've got actual solutions Mm -hmm. uh, in writing that the legislature more than welcome to take action on. (laughs) And almost yeah. like they completely inward. Uh, you know, legislation like this uh, is something that I think gets introduced in one session. Um, it's not, you know, it's not going to pass this session. But if you have, um, you know, some dedicated uh, lawmakers who continue reintroducing the bills, who keep this up, um, you know, that's that's how you get a yeah. bill passed in the long run mm-hmm. is by continuing to reintroduce the bill session after session, having these things written where next time around, you know, assuming that they don't pass the session, um, yeah. you know, next time the bill's ready to go, mm-hmm. we introduce it, you know, on as soon as day one yep. and it's ready in the hopper. Um, mm-hmm. and people can use these as an example of what we should be doing uh, to protect the people of the state of Ohio. Yeah. yeah. So 
And something actually good that did actually pass in the Ohio legislature was a bill to allow for expedited partner treatment for sexually transmitted infections. So Ohio was one of four states in the entire United States that up until this point didn't allow doctors to write a script for your partner to get treated for the STD. So you come in with chlamydia, you get the antibiotic, but you're going home to a partner who doesn't have the antibiotic. What's going to happen? You're going to get reinfected as soon as you finish your course of antibiotics. So this will allow for you to um, take up to get up to two additional prescriptions for antibiotics for two two partners, huh. so that oh, yeah. you can you can go and yes, <laughs> it doesn't really you know, and it was a compromise because a lot of our healthcare our health departments were talking about you know this is kind of the they they jokingly called it like this is the you know wife and mistress kind of scenario. <laughs> okay. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> and, and, you know, in a health, in a health, you know, in a health center's clinic, you know, th they're not seeing that. They're seeing, you know, group of high school students who are just kind of all having sex together right. yeah. or, you know, it's not just three people. So, you know, it was still a compromise because a lot of the healthcare experts really wanted it to be a much larger number, but you know, this was a good place to start to get at least something happening. So, so soon I, I, it's passed both chambers and I think it's awaiting Kasich's signature. You know, he'd have to actually come back to Ohio and not a campaign camp capacity to sign a bill. So, you know, we might be waiting a little while. Um, <laughs> or maybe not. No, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hopefully um, it'll um, be signed here in the next week or so, 90 days will go into effect and doctors will be able to more effectively treat their patients for sexually transmitted diseases because Ohio, especially Franklin County where Columbus is, their RSCD rates are through the roof yeah. compared to other states around the country. I got a um, postcard um, at my old apartment, um, which is across the street from my new apartment. But anyway, <laughs> I got, um, like a little postcard from the Ohio Department of Health saying that there was a syphilis outbreak, mm -hmm. um, in Franklin County. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Our STD rates are ridiculously high. Um, especially yeah. in Franklin County. We, we lead in, I think, syphilis and maybe chlamydia. I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it's, it's bad. So hopefully this will help relieve those things. So, you know, some good mm -hmm. things are happening. I think people think that we somehow live in the future <laughs> and all of these, these venereal diseases are uh, somehow dead and gone. Right. No. Which, uh -uh. Yeah. not so much. Not the case. <laughs> yeah. So. so, yeah. Uh, okay. Should we move on to the let's get it on segment? You want to talk cool. about issue one? Yay. Let's get it on. Okay. <laughs> so, um, today in Let's Get It On, we have endorsed issue one um, to kind of go back on our pro choice bills yeah. <laughs> that we want to introduce. Um, no, they're probably not going to pass this <laughs> session or the next. However, um, we have to keep putting them forward, as Gabe said. And another way to get them passed is by getting the crazies out. And um, this is what <laughs> this bill wants to do by having fair districts so we can have fair elections. Um, so it's going to end the partisan process. And it's going to be a bipartisan process um, with the goal that districts will be more compact and therefore more competitive. Because right now, the way the districts are gerrymandered so badly, um, you just cut in like this small group of people so that they're voting over here with this large group of people. And um, it's not it's not fair. It's not fair representation. Mm -hmm. And that's how all of these seats continue to remain so safe. And then therefore, these politicians feel like beholden to these certain groups because they want to keep their seat. They want to keep winning. And so right. they just don't do anything or they do the extreme things mm -hmm. to make the extremists happy because they're the ones who are like, well, if you don't do what we say, we're going to, I mean, it's like, and at this point in time, it's like, you don't worry about, you know, it's not, you know, Republican against Democrat or, in, um, or independent thrown in there is most likely someone who's going to be even more to the right than yeah. they are, which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't think it can happen, but it can. Yes. Yeah, so you can find someone <clears throat> even more to the right. Thing. Yeah than some of these people, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it's not going to take place until 2020, um, unfortunately. But yeah. I was really happy. There's something passed like on my second day. 
Yeah. Here with NARAL. We went to the state house <laughs> and they had been working on this a long time and I got to see it pass. And I was, I, was, I mean, mm-hmm. I thought that was very awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's a perfect, my, my actual Senate, state Senate district is a perfect example of that. So when they redistricted most recently, my old state Senator Jim Hughes lives 0.8 miles from my house. Okay. My current state senator, when I got redistricted, lives in an entirely different county than I do. And you're pretty much in the middle of Columbus. Yes. So I'm in the middle of Franklin County. My current state senator lives in Delaware County, one county north. And he lives, he lives in the northern part of that county. There so are he, hundreds of thousands of people in between mm-hmm. you and your elected yes. official, literally. Uh huh. And the other state senator actually lives 0.8 miles from my house. And then actually um, Senator Tavares actually lives like three miles from my house. So, you know, there are three or four state senators closer to my house than my current state senator. And how can he be really representing a rural county like Delaware County and my urban neighborhood in the middle of Columbus is ridiculous. So that's a perfect example of why we need to fix these to make them more compact and make them fairer so that they actually have to run and talk to, talk to people about issues. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's when we start to win because we know that people are on our side of these issues, but we can't get anything through because of gerrymandered districts. So we need fair districts. It's also going to include, um, I think another good part of the bill is going to include, having public hearings mm-hmm. um, so to try to make the process more transparent. So I think that'll be a really good thing. Um, as far as events coming up, so this Sunday, we're going to have a rally in Dayton. So if you're in the Dayton area, please join us. Um, this Sunday, November 1st, from 1 to 2 p.m. in Courthouse Square is at 3rd and Main in Dayton. And we'll be out there. We'll be speaking, um, the League of Women Voters, the Dayton Women's Rights Alliance, and hopefully it's going to be a really a really good turnout. And early vote is open all weekend long this weekend, so you can go vote for issue one tomorrow if you want. I mean, actually, you can vote tomorrow because it's Friday. <laughs> Saturday, Saturday they're open all day. I think it's like 8 to 4, Sunday 1 to 4, um, and then they are actually open Monday as well. So if you want to vote early, go out and do that too. Okay. Vote yes for issue one. Yes. yes. Do you know where uh, Engagement in Ohio is? Since you brought up uh, wait engagement Ohio? engagement Ohio no it's halfway between uh, Dayton and Marion <laughs> and on that joke we'll see everybody next week. <laughs> 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 <laughs>